Hello. Hey, Simon. <laughs> hey, Simon. It's Skyler. Hey, Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. What's up, Simon? Hello. Simon. How you doing? Hey. Hello. 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 Simon. Simon. Hello, Simon. Hello, Simon. This is Simon Brooks, and I am the host of Conversations with Storytellers. Welcome back to the new season with conversations with some of our elders from the storytelling profession who still tell folk and fairy tale. Each shares their thoughts on our profession and gems of wisdom. Some of them might even share a story. I'm glad you're here. I have heard of Ed Stivender for years. He's been around a long time. He's a very private person, yet so gregarious on the stage, impish, funny and clever. When I was asked by my good friend Megan Hicks to come and do a house concert in media just outside of Philly, Pennsylvania, I asked Ed if he would be up for having a chat with me. He said yes, and I am very pleased he did. Thanks, Megan, for letting me come earlier to do this, and thanks so much to Ed for agreeing to be one of my conversations. Please enjoy the wonderful Ed Stivender. Um, Ed, as far as I understand, you... I was a little bit confused because I listened to an interview that was done earlier this year, which I didn't know existed until a week ago. With whom? Um, it was some some author, and I can't. It was a podcast. Is it done this year? Do you think? Yes, it was. I, well, it sounded. It was produced and put out this year. I don't know when okay. the interview was done. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, but the guy said that you started in 1977, and uh-huh. then and then then I was looking at something else that said that you started in 1980. Uh-huh. So I was a little bit confused as to when you actually started storytelling. Oh, and started storytelling? Yeah. Um, 1950, 1950, at the age of five years old. Okay. Yeah. So you want to rephrase the question to make it more, <clears throat> I, I can give another answer depending on how it goes. <laughs> For, um, uh, no, that's so, so what kind of stories were you telling when you were five years of age? Um, mostly um, jokes to entertain my parents, knock-knock jokes, okay. and um, maybe stories about how I had a fight with a neighbor, or maybe that kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah. And then when you progressed <clears throat> on, you... St- the st- next stage was mm-hmm. 1952, thank you very much for asking. <laughs> 1952 is another answer to the question. Okay. I first started on the stage in 1955 okay. when Sister Patrick Mary, my third grade nun, mm-hmm. invited me to be the main guy in the St. Patrick's Day play. She knew that I knew how to read and memorize, and she thought I might be a good bet. She put me on the stage, and that was the beginning of a long, wonderful career of listening to applause. When I heard the applause of the audience, I was hooked on performance. Wow. I went on to do Tiny Tim in eighth grade, because at that time I was a boy soprano okay. in the high school play. I did plays at my high school, Monsignor Bonner High School, as well as the girls' school next door, Archbishop Prendergast High School. And then in college, I started doing Shakespeare. And that was a very important time for me. It allowed me to get rid of my Philadelphia accent, which I really regret because I can't get it back except on Thanksgiving when I'm with my family and Mummer's Day when I'm down on Broad Street with the other Philadelphians. But my neutralization of the accent allows me to do shows all over the world without being regionally identified. Do you like being not regionally identified, or do you? You said you regret it, so I regret not being able to do a good Philadelphia accent okay. on stage. Right. But you don't. You, you like the, the the ability to not be placed into a geographical area. I do. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that's important? I think it's yes. I I think it is important for audiences. I think it's important for audiences that they hear a neutral accent close to the one they hear on television. Okay. Yeah. Because that's what they're used to. Yeah. That makes sense. I like that. Well, thank you. It's a good answer, right? (laughs) Oh, thank you. (laughs) Thank you, Simon. So when did you start doing it professionally? Yeah. In 1975, I was teaching religion in high school in Hartford, Connecticut. 
I was trying to get the children's attention and said to them, do you think I'm up here because I like to hear myself talk? Yes, Mr. Stivender. And at that moment, I knew that there was something outside of teaching that I was supposed to be doing. I joined up with the Plum Cake Players Children's Theater, Mm -hmm. worked for them for two years. And then in 1976, met Connie Reagan Blake and Barbara Freeman of the Folktellers, who told me about the storytelling movement out of Jonesboro, Tennessee. I went to Jonesboro in 1976 and saw this wonderful event of the Storytelling Festival with Ray Hicks and Connie Reagan Blake and Barbara Freeman and David Holt and a host of others to an audience of about 200 and I was hooked. And this was when they had Bells of Hay outside the courthouse, right? <laughs> That's correct. And that, that was that the only stage? Um, I, no, no, there was also um, a place called um, Sisters Row, which had storytelling in the um, in the, the drawing room or the dining room where I saw Ray Hicks mm-hmm. tell stories about Jack and Doc McConnell tell his medicine yarns. And they also had events in the Methodist Church. So it was a pretty small festival, but it wasn't quite the uh, primitive setting of the hay bale and um, hay truck of the first couple of years. This was the fourth year of the festival. Okay. So you you really were in at the beginning. I went to see it at the beginning. Yeah. The next year, my head had grown enough to leave the Plum Cake Players uh-huh. and go on my own, thanks to Francilia Butler of the University of Connecticut, who called me up and said, um, she called me up and said, would you like to come to my children's literature class and tell stories to the college kids? Most of whom were football players who were taking this course because it was a piece of cake, so they thought. It was a brilliant course. At that course, Marie Sendak would present, Big Bird would present, and Ed Stivender would present. And Ed Stivender was voted best lecturer um, several times in a row. And it was very fine to work for these college kids, and it allowed me to develop material the most important of which is The Kingdom of Heaven is Like a Party, which is my religious comedy show. Mm. And so it was, that was in 1977. I worked for her maybe for six years straight until she passed away. So one of the questions I was going to ask you about was, was, was Shakespeare and how, how you got into that. And you just said that that came from college. Okay. And Let me finish the timeline, though. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, 1977, I started doing my own show mm-hmm. solo. Okay. In 1980, Barbara Freeman and Connie Reagan Blake, who had been traveling around the countryside, beating the bushes for solo performance to become storytellers, invited me to come to the National Storytelling Festival. Mm-hmm. So, when I say that I've been telling since 1980, that means I've been telling nationally since 1980, right. although I started as a solo performer in 1977. Okay. That's where the discriminate. That's where the discrepancy might be. Okay. So Shakes. So I, I've seen you perform, and I've listened to a couple of your. You watched a couple of your YouTube videos, and you can tell that there's that you've been influenced by Shakespeare in some way. Mm. Um, the choice of your words, the way that you you elocute, and all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. you, that that comes across. Mm-hmm. Tell me how, what kind of impact did Shakespeare's work have on you when you were introduced to it Mm -hmm. as a performer? Mm -hmm. Went to St. Joseph's College in 1964 and met Dr. Frank Ollie, who directed the plays at St. Joe's. I auditioned and got the part of the first messenger in Richard III. In Kent, my liege, the Guilfords are in arms. And every hour, more Confederates flock to the rebels, and their power grows strong. That was the line that I had, and that was the accent that I was beginning to try to get. I probably sounded more like Rocky Balboa the first time I was on that stage. (laughs) But after four years of working with Dr. Raleigh, I had what I think is a neutral accent. And I can play around with accents thanks to the Shakespeare Acting in Shakespeare in an ensemble is a wonderful experience. 
In 1965, I was invited to play the fool in King Lear, and that was an amazing thing with Ed Panic under the direction of Dr. Ollie. In 1966, Dr. Ollie invented the Philadelphia Shakespeare, um, Philadelphia Shakespeare Company, and that summer, 1966, we did Midsummer Night's Dream and the Scottish play. You may know that it's bad luck yeah, to yeah. say the name of the Scottish play. Well, it's particularly bad luck to produce the Scottish <laughs> play in your first attempt to do a Philadelphia Shakespeare festival. Because our bottom and Duncan found himself wandering at the edge of the stage and falling into the pit, breaking his arm, which meant that everybody had to be recast. So there is good reason not to say the name of the Scottish play. Right. Midsummer Night's Dream, we did a children's version of that in which I played Puck on the stage of the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, which was the greatest moment of my life to that point. And I'm very proud of doing that. I was at the Academy of Music the other day to see some ballet and it was wonderful to go to a house that you've worked even though that was in 1966, and here we are in 2000-something, I think. I'm yeah. not sure. 2019. Is it yeah. 19 already? Yeah. Yikes. Soon coming up to be 20. It's crazy. Oh, boy. After um, doing shit... Has, yeah. has the space changed much? Or is it pretty no, much no, it hasn't. Yeah. It's been cleaned up and spruced up. They took the chandelier down and redid that, um, but the ceiling is the same, and the right. house is the same, and... Uh, the seats are refurbished, I think, um, but the views are the same and the sound is the same. I think the hall is 1850, but it's wow. a brilliant, brilliant hall. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice to do that. And it's really nice to go back and see the ballet there, too, as well. I'm glad it's still in place. You are a very puckish character. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Nice. Thank you very much. I can much. see you fit in that Thank role. you very Perfect. much. Thank you very much. So I'm going to switch the timeline a little yes. bit, going jumping back. What was yes. it like being you as a, as a kid growing up? Oh. What was your life like? Ah, oh, it was the best. I'm a part of the baby boom, as you may know, mm -hmm. uh, which meant that um, all of my neighbors were children of veterans of World War II. Mm -hmm. I lived in a place called Westbrook Park, which was row houses set on rolling hills. Philadelphia is known for row houses in straight, flat lanes. But when you try to adapt row houses in hills on an old farm, you get um, interesting terrains. But the best thing about it was in the back of our block of seven houses, there was a yard that was connected and not split up by fencing so that we had a football field of about 35 yards that we could play football on and baseball on and so growing up in that situation was a really wonderful thing to, to be able to play in the backyard uh, with my neighbors in a, a pretty extended backyard. Now I found out later that some people have that much yard of their own house mm -hmm. but I didn't know it at the time and it didn't really matter to me that we only had a tiny backyard but we had connections with the rest of the neighbors backyards and that was wonderful yeah I think that's I think it's more important that you you know it's, it's okay having a big backyard if you if you're only one playing in it's not much fun yeah <laughs> if, if you've got a whole bunch of backyards that are yeah. tiny that are all connected yeah. and you've got all your friends there that's that's phenomenal it really was phenomenal and do you still keep in touch with some of these people that you some of them are still there in fact i'm oh. still there oh you are yes after leaving home at age 21 um and going throughout uh, various parts of my life i um took the house over went back to the old home place after my mom passed away and um bought the place from my sisters to whom the house had been left and so I'm still in this house that I grew up in so which cool. I um, feel very blessed about and some of the neighbors are still there um, on one side uh, um, has been a neighbor since 1954 so it's pretty sweet that there are still some people in the old in the old neighborhood and you were able to reconnect with them 
Yes. That's really nice. Yeah, yeah. So, did you? Are you the oldest or the youngest, or in the middle of your sister? That was or? another. Ac- that was another aspect of the wonderfulness of growing up. I was the oldest boy among three younger sisters, which meant that I did not have to wash a dish until I moved out of the house. I was never required to do any cooking, and I had chores like taking care of the basement, but having three sisters do the real household work was wonderful. And it still is because uh, at Christmas time I'll be with them and they will do all the cooking and I will just bring a box of chocolates. That's a very, so I was very, very lucky. Dated way of looking at life. I was very <laughs> lucky growing up. And I was also lucky that I got to go to the Catholic school which was right around the corner and which was free and which was a wonderful place to grow up. The discipline of the Catholic school matched the discipline of the household run by my Navy veteran father. Obedience was something that I understood and there was no conflict between my activities at school and my activities at home. Nowadays, I think it's edu- nowadays I think education is a little bit trickier since everyone has their own lawyer. All the children have their own lawyers. And so the issues at school and the issues at home are sometimes in conflict. But when I was growing up in the 50s, it was the same world in yeah. both places. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting society that we live in now. It's, it's very skewed. Uh, and I think that, that there's, I don't know, this whole entitlement thing is mm-hmm. just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's a, it, I think it, it's ruining culture. Mm-hmm. And, and people yeah so does I know that you do this and you mentioned it earlier that you do this This you have a show that is based around being Catholic yeah and you've written two books about yeah still a Catholic and, and there's two books well, I can't remember the names of the books then. Raised Catholic yeah can you tell can you yeah and still Catholic after all these fears <laughs> that's right after the first book people would come up to me at book signings and say, are you still Catholic? So I wrote the second book and called it Still Catholic After All These Fears. And I am still Catholic, as a matter of fact. Um, So I am still Catholic. You're very devout Catholic. Well, I don't know about devout, but I I do believe um, that um, a good Catholic would not admit to being devout. Okay. I do go to Mass. Okay, and do you think your your religion has has it influenced the work that you do a lot? Aside from the your Catholic show, yes, I think it has influenced my work. Yes, and how has it done that? Hmm. I think my faith has influenced my work in the same way that her faith influenced Flannery O'Connor's work. Flannery O'Connor is a short story and novel author from the South who was a brilliant author and whose work is deeply imbued with Catholicism but her characters are not necessarily Catholic but her Catholicism is the stream that runs underneath everything that happens in her works. So Catholicism is important in the basis of my work and the choices that I make about what stories I tell and how stories end. I don't think I have ever told a story that has an unhappy ending. And I think that goes back to my Catholicism. Even though there's great tragedy in the story that is the basis of the Catholic faith, that is the story of Jesus, Mm -hmm. who gets crucified thanks to a collusion between Jerusalem and Rome. 
but there is resurrection at the end of that story. So I'm careful about giving stories with sad endings, and I think that's a Catholic thing. My story is about raised Catholic. My stories in the book, Raised Catholic, Can You Tell, are obvious Catholic stories that develop actual Catholic events in my Catholic youth, but all of my work is mm, imbued with my faith, I think. So, so when, when you were talking about that, it made me think of like the bagpipes and how the bagpipes have that drone. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, 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 your, your faith is the drone and the story nice. of the notes. Nice. Is it, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's kind of cool. I like that. Yeah. It's not kind of cool. That's cool. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you've got eight CDs at albums, and mm -hmm. you've got the two books. Yeah. Are you planning on doing any more recordings? Because what I noticed about your recordings is that a lot of these are live shows yeah. that you've taken from Jonesboro. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you go into the studio again and record? Is there something that you, you that you feel that's not out there yet that you would like to put out there into the into the world as part of your legacy? Something that um, you haven't done yet. Yeah. If I were to do a studio project, mm -hmm. I think it would be literary pieces oh, like really? O. Henry, uh, The oh. Gift of the Magi, and The Ransom of Red Chief, and um, Mark Twain, and some other authors. I would love to do The Congo by Vachel Lindsay, but there wouldn't be a market for that at this point for various reasons. Why would you want to do that? I'm curious. I don't know the work. So. Oh, yeah, it is a brilliant, it is a brilliant rhythmic work. Um, it is a brilliant rhythmic work. Vachel Lindsay was a, was a genius, and he was a performer himself, and he wrote this thing, The Congo, which was a piece that was memorized by school children and other people all through the 50s and, you know, the 30s and 40s and 50s, but now is inappropriate okay. for um, use. But I would love to do it. In fact, I have it prepared, but I have yet to do it on stage because of it, it, it's incorrect. Um, so if I went back to the studio, I would um, do classical work, I think. Okay. And or my Christmas sonnets. Every Christmas I write a sonnet. You do? And make it in my Christmas card. And this has been going on for maybe 12 years. And um, some of them are brilliant. Uh, and all of them are uh, iambic pentameter, which goes back to Shakespeare again. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. So one of the things that you mentioned about Congo is, is the, the rhythm that you have. Yeah. That it has. Yeah. And one of the things I, when I listened to this other interview, you talked about when you choose a story to tell it, it yeah. has to have something to do with the structure of the story. Absolutely. And it's the structure of the story that, that, that grips you, not necessarily the story itself. Mm -hmm. Though obviously that, you have to like that as well. Mm -hmm. So explain what kind of structure, what kind of rhythm mm -hmm. draws your attention? What, what kind of stories pull you in? And what is the structure that you find so attractive? Hmm. A structure which has well-placed surprises. One of the things I like about O. Henry, of course, is the well-placed surprise at the end of an O. Henry story. I do a piece called Sir Gawain and Lady Regnell. Uh -huh. And I like that piece because the structure of it has um, two kind of arcs. One arc is the setup of the problem of the piece, and the other arc is the resolution of the problem in the piece and I like the fact that there is a snap to it a, a point at which the story turns uh, and an insight might come out like Joyce's uh, James Joyce's epiphanies I like stories that have epiphanies right so it's kind of like the um, the aha moment yes of a story the gestalt Yes. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I agree. So you you like a story with with that that snap in it. Yes. So I heard you mention the snap. I do like the snap. Yeah. 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 And I think I think those are important too because 
a, a, a lot of stories have the same kind of motifs or they have they follow a pattern yeah, yeah. And everyone's like oh kind of know what's going on here yeah. but then if you come up with a story that has a snap in it that yeah. that flips it on its head yeah yeah then that's that's a lot of fun yes I agree. for you as the teller as well as the audience because, ah. because they get that unexpected it's like giving them a little gift you yes know? it's like thank you for sitting through this and thinking that you you know what's happening and, right. and here's something different that's right and everybody loves that yeah yeah so I agree I, I totally I agree. That. you've told a lot of Jack stories mm. um, but then and, and your other stories your other folk tales them they're, they're more reinventions mm-hmm. yeah you know like your princess and the frog oh yeah <laughs> it's, it's a phenomenal story well thank you very much it's a wonderful reinvention of it thank you um so how do you how, when you look at a traditional story like the, the princess and the frog yeah and then you do this like wonderful spin on it you give him like this kind of like almost New York Brooklyn type of character and the, the princess is obviously a snot um, <laughs> yes but how, how did you come up with that, that that point of view that you came up with for that particular story and, and how do you come up with points of these different points of views for the other stories that you tell? Hmm. Well, um, this actually, um, the, the story of that story goes back to Shakespeare. I developed that story in 1977, early on in my career, when I was invited by the Episcopal Church of Hartford, Connecticut, to do a presentation for their day school. The original version of The Princess and the Frog was written entirely in iambic pentameter. It became clear to me that the children at the Episcopal daycare were not really interested in my structure of iambic pentameter, and so the story is no longer iambic pentameter, <laughs> which shows something about the dynamism of my work. My work grows thanks to the dance dialogue that I have with my audience. Those children who had to sit through that iambic pentameter version let me know through their um, squiggles and various um, responses that it was not that good to tell a story (laughs) in iambic pentameter to five-year-olds. And so I dropped the iambic pentameter and move the thing around. I really like that story because it does have my way of fooling around with traditional structures and motifs and coming up with different mm, uh, insights about it. You can also see that this story is sort of dated because it has things that are uh, that were available in the culture back then that aren't really that available now. For instance, the line when the frog asks the princess to give him a kiss, the princess goes, "Oh, gag me with a magic wand," which a reflect, which is a reflection of the Valley Girl motif of the six seventies and eighties of gag me with a spoon. Oh. So that's an example of something which. I still keep because I like the way the story flows, right. but only boomers get the old reference, reference yeah. to the gag me with a spoon. I say only American. Only American boom. Only American. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. Because I never got that reference. Oh, when, well, there when you I go. heard that story. Oh, but so. did it work anyway? Was it? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh good. No, I loved it. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, good. I just thought it was a nice twist of humor. Oh, know? thank you. Yeah. No, it, it, I mean, it <clears> kind of jumped out. I was like, oh, I kind of like that one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Thank you, Simon. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, yeah. It's a, yeah. There are some stories that I've used references to myself, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I've stopped using it because it was it was pop culture, mm-hmm. and that the culture that, that it applied to is no longer my audience. Ah, you know, the audience is much younger than it was ten years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. And what was funny ten years ago in yeah. pop culture, yeah. re- as a reference, is, yeah. is no. And sometimes things come around and you can bring them back in again, but. 
You know, yeah. you have to, it's it's a waste of time. It's a wasted gag. It's a wasted moment. Yeah, yeah. So you can drop it. And, and right. So, yeah, yeah. I right. totally get that. Totally and get there that. are other reasons for dropping and bringing things and changing things in stories, which, mm-hmm. um, which are interesting as well. For instance, in the story of Jack and the Magic Boat, which is my version of Hardy Hardhead, a traditional Jack tale from the mountains, I have shoot well, shoot a rifle, and solve the problem by shooting a thing off of uh, another thing and bring everything to a good conclusion. However, after Columbine, I felt that having a guy with a rifle Mm -hmm. is not going to be particularly helpful for my audiences. And so I changed the Shootwell character from a marksman to an archer. And so now he shoots an arrow, which structurally is not as good get back to the issue of structure, Mm -hmm. structurally the moment is not as good saying twang zoom (laughs) as bang. Happily in New Zealand I had the wonderful occasion to work in a school there and in the hallway on the way to the gymnasium where the presentation was to be there were photographs of athletes in the middle school that I was working at there was the football player and the baseball player and the soccer player, which is the same as the football player in New Zealand. So there was the football player and the, there was no baseball cricket. player. Yeah, there, cricket, thanks. Yeah. there was the football player and the cricket player and the rugby, probably. rugby player. Yeah. And then, um, young woman sitting with a shotgun on her lap and she was the marksman and so I thought that since marksmanship was part of the physical education program of this school Mm -hmm. that I could bring back the rifle of Shootwell and it was really a sweet moment because I was able to implicitly honor one of the young women in the audience and bring back the snap that happens with Shootwell's bang yeah. and get rid of the dull moment of twang zzz. <laughs> yeah. What draws you to the Jack Tales and to the traditional tales? Um, I know a lot of people who started at the same time that you did moved over to personal stories, but you tend to keep telling the traditional stories. So what made you keep telling the traditional stories? What draws you to them? What's special about it? I think you're right about people going towards uh, personal stories. When I came into the business in 1980 at Jonesboro, many of the stories were traditional stories. Most of the stories were traditional stories. And then there was a serious sea change in the community of professional storytellers in the United States. Now there are more personal stories than there are traditional stories. One of the reasons, one of the facts that keeps me from doing personal stories is the fact that I was raised Irish Catholic. And in an Irish Catholic household, you don't talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. And you certainly don't talk about your aches and pains. My problem with personal stories is that too often the storyteller is talking about their aches and pains and is using the audience as a therapist to listen to their problems. That's why I stay away from personal stories. There are insights about the human psyche in traditional stories that are as valid as the insights that personal storytellers try to share with their audience, but there is no burden placed on the audience in a traditional story. Because it's one step removed and that gives them a boundary or a level of safety. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. 
it's a tr- it's a tricky business. I'm uh, a minority voice now, and every once in a while I will do a, a personal story. In fact, I was challenged to do a slam, which is a phenomenon in the storytelling community that is new to me. Mm-hmm. And a slam um, is a situation where a story slam would be where you tell a personal story, oftentimes in an oleo or a group of storytellers around a particular theme. Mm -hmm. I went to Lawrence, Kansas to do a storytelling festival and the producer, Bob Triansky, challenged me to come up with a slam, a seven minute personal story. And I did that and it was the first time I did that and it was an interesting experience and Um, I told the story there, and then when I told it again in Utah, um, the response was that I was a mean, selfish person because (laughs) of what happens in the story. Mm -hmm. The, the, The story is the answer to the question, why do you not like to stay with people when you're on the road and prefer what we call objective housing, which means staying in motels and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the fact that I was mm, placed in a basement on a a um, fur-covered couch between two aquariums that blub-blubbed all night and made a fish smell waft across my pillow the whole night. And so when I decided that I would leave the situation, I packed up my bags and tiptoed up the stairs, thinking that I would walk out of there and get a cab to a motel and found that the door was locked with a deadbolt lock without a key. Oh, wow. And this is why I don't stay with people and prefer objective housing. But when I told that story in Utah, people were very saddened by the fact that I was so intolerant of well-meaning hosts. Yeah. I get what you're saying, totally. (laughs) I totally get what you're saying. Um, You mentioned, um, it says on your website, and you've mentioned that you mentioned mumming. Um, I, I, I believe that a great majority of people in this country have no real idea what mumming is. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how you got involved in it? Uh, Yes. To mum in the dictionary means to put on a mask. In England, a mummer's play might be something that is celebrated on Boxing Day or sometime in the winter in which a group of Morris dancers, fellows with bells on their knees, and masks and painted faces go around door to door and do a play for anyone who lets them in their house. And in response, the people will give them a treat or something to drink, or perhaps in the old days, a coin. This tradition moved to America and took a very interesting form in Philadelphia in particular. The first sign of mummers in Philadelphia is a lawsuit in 1758 in which someone was brought up to court for dressing as a woman on New Year's Day. In Philadelphia, every New Year's Day, January 1st, there is a mummers parade. Part of the mummers parade are motifs from the ancient mummers play. The normal mummer's play or the traditional mummer's play would be King George and the Turkish Knight on hobby horses. And so hobby horse motifs are still part of the fancy divisions. In 1982 in Philadelphia, I decided that I would try to be in the mummer's parade to show my presentation of St. Francis of Assisi in the Kingdom of Heaven is like a party which is my favorite piece of work, doing stories in the guise of St. Francis of Assisi. And I 
set myself up in 1982 in the Mummer's Parade as St. Francis of Assisi with a false beard and an umbrella, which is a traditional Philadelphia Mummer's motif, and from the umbrella were hanging little birds on strings. The idea of Francis talking to the birds, and I marched up Broad Street in the Mummer's Parade in 1982. Since then, I have marched in the Mummer's Parade every year but two years. Recently, I have been doing marching. Recently, I have been marching in the parade with my Morris Troop, the King Sessing Morris Men, and we do various presentations of Morris dancing with traditional or political themes. I often did solo performances as a one-man character, a, 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 a most original character. I won most original character in 19... 94 for my presentation as the Vatican American String Band to celebrate <laughs> to celebrate Israel and uh, the Vatican coming together and setting up diplomatic relations. I won first prize that year for the Vatican American String Band. Last year I did a piece called Beer Come to Judge in which I honored the Supreme Court Justice who had been elected that year, in which I wore a beer hat and had a calendar and um, judge's robe and presented my presentation of Brett Kavanaugh. I've also attempted to roast our senator from Pennsylvania who voted in the impeachment trial of Clinton instead of saying guilty or not guilty he said not proved quoting Scottish law that year I marched in a Scottish dance mocking the decision of that senator to use Scottish law on the floor of the United States Senate. The Mummers Comics in Philadelphia is a way for people to resist improper power with comedy. It's a classical foolish thing to do and I like to think of myself as a classical fool at least on Mummer's Day. Right. I am a member of Les Jongleurs de Notre Dame, a crack paraliturgical medical paramedic. I am a member of Les Jongleurs de Notre Dame, a crack paraliturgical paramedical parenthetical order whose primary purpose is to speak truth to power in comic ways. Wow, that's quite a title. I am so deep. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the uh, the um, beer comes the judge. That's a hats off to Rowan and Martin. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Show. Oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And this points out something that I really like to do, which is take motifs that are already in the culture and take them, spin them around, and uh, them. and use them. Yeah. 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 So beer comes. That is Rowan and Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Which is one of those few shows that I watched in the UK. Yeah. Um, that came over, that made it over. Yeah. Um, if you could meet any storyteller, living or dead, yeah, and spend some time with them, swapping stories or talking about technique or yeah. you know processes, who who do you think that would be? Yeah. And why would you pick that person? Yeah. Um, besides Shakespeare, you mean? Yes. Besides I, Shakespeare. Actually, Will Kemp. It would be Will Kemp, who was Shakespeare's favorite comic actor, also a Morris dancer, who danced from London to Norwich in nine days and published a book called The Nine Days Wonder in 1600, which I did a show of years ago. Um, he was last seen mumming over the Alps on his way to Rome to meet the Pope. He was never seen again. Um, Flannery O'Connor. I would love to sit down with Flannery O'Connor and share stories about Catholicism. Um, uh, James Joyce. 
Um, storytellers in my own tradition, I think um, uh, people like um, Ray Hicks. Yeah. I would like to sit down with Ray Hicks again. I sat down with him in several contexts um, before he passed, but um, I would like to be with Ray Hicks again. And as a Catholic, I believe that I will be um, sometime. Yeah. Not soon. No, it's hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> sitting in a couple of chairs like the one you're sitting in. Yeah, which is very comfortable. Yeah, I haven't sat in that young. I'm going to try that later. Yeah. You're a very private person. Very you, private you person. You come across as being a very private person. Well, thank you. I'm glad. And, and in my emails to you, which which I received with a big smile on my face, I didn't take anything personally. Um, I thought it was very well. I, for, for, for those of you who are listening, um, I invited myself to Ed's house to stay, um, extending my trip here in Pennsylvania. And Ed wrote back saying, thank you very much for inviting yourself, but I think I should decline the offer, <laughs> which I thought was a very, very nice way of saying bog off <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, but the interior um, uh, interior dynamism was oh no I have to clean my house <laughs> oh is that really yeah that, okay. that's more what it was about than okay. anything else but also from, from meeting you in Jones we're in Timpanogos I know that you are a, a somewhat private person and yet yeah. the kind of person that you put yourself up on on stage and you know the one of the one of the newspapers has claimed you as a Robin Williams mm. type person which I would agree with Thank you. Um, but you have a very, very large presence on stage, and you, your your characters are very gregarious. And yet, there's this other side of you. How do you reconcile those two pieces of your of your person? Hmm. Mm. Or well, don't you just compartment? Do you compartmentalize it, or? I guess I do comp uh, compartmentalize it, and it has to do with. Um, is it part of the Irish Catholic thing? Yeah. I think it's definitely part of the Irish Catholic thing. I think it has to do with being able to lead the dance. When I'm on stage, I am involved in a kind of meaning dance with the people in my audience. And being on stage allows me to lead that dance. I enjoy leading the dance. Yeah. So I get that. We'll move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, w when did you find your... your st you, you said at the beginning that you started at a very young age telling stories, yeah. and, and then you progressed and things altered, and you got to college in the Shakespeare, but when did you find, when did you find your, your own voice, and how did you find your own voice? What was that, that gestalt moment that happened for you, that, that aha, the snap that happens within you when Ed Stivender found Ed, the Ed Stivender storyteller voice? Hmm... Or was it a slow evolution, going working with the players and, and trying things out yeah. and suddenly realizing? What? Yeah, there was a snap moment. There was a snap moment that happened when I was teaching high school in West Hartford, Connecticut, at the Northwest Catholic High School. A wonderful situation. I was telling stories from the Bible to my freshman class, and I was telling the story of Jacob going to meet his bride. And I mimed out... Jacob riding a camel across the desert to meet his bride. The kids in the classroom laughed so hard that I realized that there was something very important about storytelling and keeping the attention of a class of 14-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And that was a moment when I felt some kind of leading to be a storyteller. That was a snap moment. So that might have been one of the moments when I felt my voice as a storyteller. So you, you, I know that you're a teacher, but what I didn't realize was I, I'd assume that you're a professional storyteller and that that was all you did. But I get the impression, because when I was talking to, to Megan this morning, she said you just retired from teaching not, not that long ago. And that was a bit of a surprise to me. Uh -huh. So you, you've always been a teacher up until fairly recently, as well as a storyteller. Um, Is that right? Am I right? Um, uh, not exactly. Okay. I, um, I started storytelling in 1977, right. which was 42 years ago. Thank you very much. Okay. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, 40, 
two years ago. And during that, within that time, I taught uh, religion and English in high school for about six years. Okay. So I was a storyteller all of that time. Right. And at one point I went back to teaching because there was a job available at my old high school. No way. Yeah. So I got to go back to the high school where I started my... Um, <clears throat> went back to the high school where I used to do shows at the girls' high school. And then the girls' high school and the boys' high school became one high school. And it was too sweet uh, an offer to pass up. So, in fact, I did find myself back in the classroom for six years. Oh. Yeah. So there was a period of time when you were only telling stories? Yes, there was. Between 1977 and 19... Uh, no, 1977 and 2005. Right. And so the other day, um, I was doing a story uh, for a celebration in Philadelphia, and didn't one of my best students show up and I hadn't seen her in 13 years. And that was a very sweet thing to, That's to have. That's really cool. Yeah, that That's was very, very cool. sweet. Yeah. And did you, so when you were a teacher teaching all these things, did you work on your stories with, with the kids? I yes. Mean, obviously, you weren't practicing your whole craft. You'd already worked on the stories, but then right. you would practice this, the stories on the kids without them knowing that. Yeah. They well, sometimes. Yeah. Um, uh, they knew. <laughs> they <knew. laughs> yeah, they knew. Um, but but the the classroom is a um, wonderful place to work. But that was not my main reason for um, teaching at that point. What 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 did you like about teaching most? Interaction with the kids. Yeah, the challenge of daily interaction with personalities and egos that I wanted to mm, uh, help understand. The world. That's really cool. I like that. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of kids need guidance. And so, is it still a Catholic school to this day? The school that I taught at. Yeah. Yes, and but it's co-ed, co-institutional now. It was um, boys on one side, girl, girls in one building, boys in the other building. I started teaching in the girls' building, and then they joined up, and I ended up teaching co-ed in the boys' building, and the. the the school still exists. So what was the big difference between, for you, teaching just the girls and then teaching co-ed? Was, um, there, was there a big dynamic change? Yes. A, um, a single gender classroom is much easier to teach, um, especially aspects of religion, especially aspects of morality. Can you expand especially, on that? especially aspects of sexual morality. It is much easier to talk to a group of all girls mm -hmm. or all boys. And in fact, even though the school this school is coeducational, co institutional, mm -hmm. the religion classes are single gender. And that was uh, one aspect of uh, I can understand, I can understand the you know, moral and sexual stuff being t taught separately because mm -hmm. I think you know it, it leads to less embarrassment and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. What was the thing about religion that needed to be, that people felt that needed to be separated by gender? Um, because morality is a pretty important part of the Catholic tradition, and it, it's right. a Catholic school. That's that. There are other aspects of Catholicism where gender doesn't really matter. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think, though, that the dynamic, the um, the hormonal dynamic in a classroom of all one gender, mm -hmm. is much easier um, to uh, present to than mixed hormonics. Hormonics. I like I'm not that. sure I, I, I have heard that word before. Word. Yeah, hormonics. Um, and so it. it so do you think you can go deeper with the morals because because of the there's not the embarrassment of yes yes or, or the want to play up right to the opposite right. sex right. And in any co-ed situation, there is a sexual tension in the air that is not necessarily helpful to mm. certain aspects of education. Yeah, 
I'd agree with that. Mm. I'd agree with that. Is there something that you know now that you wish you'd known when you first started working as a performing artist, as a professional storyteller? Um, I'd like to share with young budding people. That <laughs> trying to uh, I, I'm sorry. I it, it, most recently, I'm um, sorry. I didn't know aspects of um, cyber narrative. Uh, only recently have I developed a mailing list and a way of reaching potential audiences uh, using um, email. I've avoided email most of my life. I've avoided most of the 20th century <laughs> since it came into being in 19 and whenever it did, 2001. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, if I had known, if, if I had been more comfortable, then I, I would uh, not be as uncomfortable getting started now in my old age. So are you a technophobe? I might be a technophobe. I might be a Luddite in general, yes. I wouldn't say Luddite. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah? Um, well, I'm trying to work on it. Yeah. What is your favorite trick to hold an audience? Well, I can tell you my favorite trick to get the audience's attention at the beginning of a show when there are resistant people in the audience, uh -huh. say a high school group. Right. Oftentimes you'll go in to work for a high school group or a junior high school group and in the room there will be young people who are sitting there with a resistant physical attitude. Their arms folded on their chest, a scowl on their face, leaning back in their seats. This is a First Amendment right not to listen to someone who is being forced upon them by the principal who has just <laughs> introduced you. Yeah. However, you can't really tell stories to an audience that is sitting there resistantly. So my favorite trick when I'm faced with that kind of an audience is to play my banjo and start with singing an old country song, Old Joe Clark was a rambling man, preached all over the plains, which only, um, which only encourages them to go deeper into their resistant posture. Mm. At the end of Old Joe Clark, I go, Well, everybody come around and listen to me. I'm a signifying honky. I'm a hot MC. The response of this trick is to break the resistant posture with their arms folded and move around in disbelief sometimes give each other a high five because of the surprise of seeing an ancient white man try to use a young urban street form of rap and getting away with it. Once their physical resistance is broken, their mental resistance, hopefully, yeah. is broken and you can proceed because there's a level of trust that's necessary to continue right. the dance between the storyteller and the audience. Right. That's my favorite trick. That's yeah, because it, it you're setting them up to to um, strengthen their belief system of what you are, mm -hmm. and then you shatter it, mm -hmm. and then yeah. they have no idea what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they they have to be open. Yeah. Because they don't know what to expect anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, I like that. That's really yeah. cool. And they can trust you because at least you know some motif that is important in their right. structure. They know that you can identify with them on some sort of level. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you play the banjo. I do. And I've seen you play the banjo. You play it really well. And I was kind of disappointed that you didn't show up with it today because I thought we could hang out and like do a little music. But that's okay. Um, I heard you on recordings with a harmonica. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never seen you play. I don't think I've seen you play the harmonica. <clears throat> so, are there any other instruments that you play? If you want to share that. <laughs> yeah, no. I, actually, I'm uh, working on Bach's uh, Prelude in C uh, currently. The first part of which I learned when I was at Notre Dame and um, never got to the second part. And finally, I'm getting to the uh, second part and I'm being very happy with that. But that's only one piece of music on piano that I know how to play. I sort of play the recorder, 
My first instrument was ocarina, which I bought for 35 cents from the money I made shining shoes at the barber shop. At, you shined shoes at a barber shop? I did. Nice. At age eight, I um, made some money and went to the music store down from the barber shop and bought an ocarina, which is a flute kind of instrument. And that was my first instrument, which I still play, sort of. So is it a ceramic or wooden hollowed out thing? The one that I bought was um, uh, plastic in 1955. The one I use now is ceramic. And it's kind of like um, a bulb, for yeah. want of a better word. It is. A sweet potato. It looks like a well, okay, sweet yeah. potato. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I play that sometimes, but not usually on stage. Um, and the mm. harm, yeah. But why don't you play it on stage? Is it just because you don't I'm feel... not that good. Okay, all yeah. right. And the harmonica? Harmonica, I don't know if you've ever listened to the harmonica that I play, but it's not really a tune. And it comes from Doc McConnell. Doc McConnell was a wonderful storyteller uh, who passed away a while back, and he was central to the beginning of the National Association for the Preservation and Perpetuation of Storytelling, which was the original name of the Jimmy Neal Smith storytelling movement, which invented me. And Doc McConnell, would, who I saw in 1976, the first time I went down there, and he would sit there with his pipe, and he would suck on his pipe. And as I watched him, I realized that he was using the pipe time to figure out what he was going to do with the next line or the next piece that he was going to do. So I went back to Philadelphia and got myself a pipe and started using pipe in storytelling and realized that it really didn't fit my mode. However, I did know about the harmonica as a way of figuring out what you were going to do. And so I adapted Doc McConnell's pipe smoking motif mm -hmm. to a harmonica so my favorite thing in the world to do is an improv fairy tale where I ask the audience for suggestions of uh, various things and then I do a improv with my harmonica and as I'm breathing in and out on the harmonica I'm figuring out what to say next if you listen closely to my harmonica work you will notice <laughs> that there aren't any tunes coming out of the harmonica it is just a guy going, blowing and drawing, blowing and drawing, <laughs> blowing and drawing. And the important thing that's going on is in his imagination, trying to figure out what he's going to say next. And that's from Doc McConnell. I like that. That's nice. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what we can, when we go and see other storytellers, and we yeah. watch them, and we, we're inspired by them. And it's not that we want to try and steal something, but... It's kind of like a springboard that you're standing on the edge and you and you want to jump but you don't know how to, uh -huh. and then you see someone else do it and you uh -huh. think, well, I can't do that, but I can do this instead, and then you jump uh -huh. off that springboard into, oh, yeah. into the water. Oh yeah, and it's interesting that you would use the pipe yeah. as a as a springboard to get to the harmonica as yeah. a way of yeah. fighting. Yeah, because it's the same way with me with my bower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I before I started playing, you know, I've been playing the drums since I was ten years of age. Oh yeah, and I got my first drum kit when I was twelve. Oh yeah, and um, what good parents. Yeah. Like patient parents. They, yes, because drums breed bands. Oh! Because, you know, in England, you, a lot of people take public transportation, so yeah. a guy can bring a guitar and a small amp on the yeah. bus. You right, can't that's right. carry a drum kit on the bus, right. so the band always practiced at our house. Oh, so, <laughs> nice! So it worked out well for me. Yeah! Um, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but with, you know, I wasn't going to bring a drum kit to a gig. A storytelling yeah. gig. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I, my fingers don't play guitar very well. Okay. Um, I tried that and that didn't work. Okay. Um, and it's like, well, what can I do that can give me some kind of space? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that storytelling space. Oh, and yeah. then I saw this movie, uh, The Sis Sisters Magdalene, which is a very hard movie to watch. Yeah. Um, and the opening scene is a wedding and there's a priest oh, yeah. and another player playing the barrel. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, that is incredible. I'd never seen it before. Oh, yeah. And I fell in love with the instrument. I bought myself a cheap one and learned how to play. Yeah, yeah. Which nearly ended up in divorce because it's like that, 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 that for three uh, days so uh, I could uh, get the uh, rhythm. Uh, 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 um, but that's, that's what I do. It's like if I can't think, if I'm looking at an audience and I, you know, I have a set list planned and I look at the audience like, this is not the right, these aren't uh, the right stories for this audience. Yeah, yeah. 
then I can pick up my drum and I'll play it and I'll be yeah. like talk, bantering with the audience yeah. and like talking about the drum and yeah, yeah. talking about storytelling as I'm trying to think of like what the heck can I tell these uh, people yeah exactly so yeah. It's, it's cool that we all do that do you use a banjo other than playing traditional tunes do you use it as part of yes. your stories mm-hmm. sometimes? yes yes I developed a piece in 1977 of Hansel and Gretel in which I play the banjo through the whole piece using two chords mostly B minor, A minor, B minor, A minor. And within that context, I sing several songs. The Hansel and Gretel have a song together. Um, the wolf has a howl with on the same chord structure. So I play it all the way through. The main use of the banjo has to do with warming up an audience. And I always use the banjo when I start a set with an audience, unless I'm in a time constrained oleo or something like that right. but whenever I do my own show I, I set up uh, with a banjo and often use the banjo as a way to relax the audience like the trick I talked about right. with the high school kids right. the audience can relax uh, the banjo can relax the audience and do you find so Jones where you're a regular feature I've been I've been uh, featured there several times and I've often been asked to be MC there. Okay. Yeah. Do you find you still have to relax that audience or can you go straight into stories? Oh, the Jonesboro audience is the most wonderful audience um, in the world, of course, but any audience has to be relaxed. It, it, it takes an audience a while to um, get your frequency, no matter whether they know you or not. Uh, when, you, when an audience knows you, it's easier, mm-hmm. but any audience has to adapt their imagination to the frequency that you are presenting. The banjo and doing a sing-along or doing a silliness at the beginning allows the audience to adapt to your frequency so that the dance can be more efficient than without having that um, Introduction of frequency adaptation. Right. Yeah, right. but I always do the do the the thing. For some people who know me, mm-hmm. um, they say, "Oh, here he goes again uh, with this. We've heard this before." But uh, they go along with it, uh, and the people who don't know me are invited to Jordan, come along. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. There, are, I think with music, it's a lot easier to play the same piece. Uh-huh. You know, when rock bands or any kind of band yeah. go and perform, it's like, oh, can you play this song? Because we love it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you ever play the banjo outside of storytelling? I mean, do you play with other? Oh people? yes, uh huh, yes. I mean, I um, know you do the thing in Jonesboro, the the the, the bands. Yeah, sometimes I play with that band, right. but there's a, another band called Aunt Jean's Band with John Walsh and Jan Smith and Bill Quern and Chris Brennan Hagee. And we have one venue that we do, and that is retired convents. The retired convent of Camilla Hall at Immaculata University and the retired convent Villa St. Joseph at Chestnut Hill College. We play for nuns, and it's our best audience. Nuns have been my best audience since third grade, but that's another band that I play with. That's kind of cool. So what is a retired nun? Yeah, exactly. There's no such thing. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, there's no such thing as a retired nun. But there are... Um, well, retired convent then. What's a retired convent? Uh, I just made that up. There's, oh, uh, <laughs> there's <laughs> there, there. It's a convent... <clears throat> you sucker punch me. There's a convent where <laughs> retired nuns live. Okay. Like a um, retirement home. Okay. Like a retirement home for nuns. I should have, well, okay. shouldn't right. have said uh, home for retired nuns. A <laughs> retirement right. home... A retirement home for nuns. Okay. For instance, Macaulay Convent in Marion, Camilla Hall in Immaculata, Pennsylvania, and St. Joseph's Villa in Chestnut Hill, okay. Philadelphia. Would you call yourself a perfectionist? Um, only when it comes to listening to other people. Oh, <laughs> that's a nice answer. I like no. that one. I'm not a perfectionist, um, eh, not necessarily. Actually, I'm an anti-perfectionist when I'm with an audience 
with whom I'm comfortable. Let me explain that. Yes, please. Um, making a mistake on stage is something that terrifies storytellers all over the world. Mm. Making a mistake for me with an audience that is comfortable with me is my greatest joy because covering the mistake that you've made is great fun. Yeah. So in that sense, I'm an anti-perfectionist because the audience enjoys my cover for mistakes that I make. You need the right audience to be able to do that. Yeah. Or you need to have the audience with you yeah. to be able to do that. And you need a story which doesn't get interrupted by a laugh covering a mistake. Right. So sometimes I let mistakes go for the sake of right. the tone yeah, of the yeah, room. Yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. Do you make many mistakes? I don't think you do, do you? Um, n uh, uh, n no, but there was one time when I was working at the Timpanoga Storytelling Festival in Utah. Another great one, festival. A wonderful storytelling festival where the audience was enjoying my mistakes so much that I was tempted to make mistakes just so I could cover myself. And there came a point where in my imagination, I saw an actual red light that was warning me that I had a choice. Either continue making mistakes and uh, entertaining the audience with my mistakes or getting on with the story. I couldn't do both. So I chose to get on with the story. Yeah, that's a slippery road. It is really tricky. <laughs> yeah, that's when you got to check your ego. Yeah, Cause yeah. Because that's, that's just a recipe for disaster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> At least I think it is. I agree. I mean, I, I, agree. I, I get, I, I can totally see where you're coming from because it can be fun. Oh, yeah. But oh, like, yeah. It's, it's, it's not about us. It's about the story. And I actually, think when we, when actually, we, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. Because um, I would... Um, disagree a little bit okay and it's not about us it's about them the audience yeah because to me the yeah. story is not as important as the dance yeah and the, well, the story is nothing without an audience yeah well, it, well there there's a whole nother thing but my, my some storytellers would like to change their audience. Some storytellers would like to educate their audience. My only intention is to give the audience a break. Yeah. The audience is the um, community that I serve and serving that audience with a break in their life is my highest goal. Yeah, I feel the same way. When you were first called Robin Williams or likened to Robin Williams, yeah, yeah. How did, what, what went through your mind when you heard that? Oh, it was a great compliment, a great honor to be called Robin Williams of storytelling because of his speed yeah. on stage and his improvisation on stage. It was a, it was, I was really honored by it. Carol Birch was the first person to use that phrase, as a matter of fact. Oh, Miami Herald, Miami Herald picked it up. Yeah, I was listening because before I saw that quote, I was listening to you. It was on YouTube, and it was the Prince and the Frog. Oh yeah, it was that story, and I was listening to that, and I was like, "This could be Robin." It's, it's like I could hear Robin Williams's voice in the story. Thank you. Which popped out, which was like, "Wow, that's." It kind of took me by surprise. Yeah, thank because you very I much. I, you know, I, having hung around you and seen Robin Williams live on stage, oh yeah, you're very very different. Uh -huh. And yet, that there's there's a connection there for sure. Yeah, thanks. Sure. I'm honored by that. You said earlier about something about being influenced by other storytellers mm -hmm. and not wanting to steal from other storytellers. Um, I uh, I have uh, I have stolen quite a bit um, it, from. I know. <clears throat> Please don't tell anybody. Okay, we won't. But it's um, a I have uh, I have stolen quite a bit. I have stolen from Donald Davis in terms of accents and sometimes in terms of posture. I have stolen from the early days of Saturday Night Live. There are pieces of my early work in and including the Kingdom of Heaven is Like a Party in which you can see um, Guido Sarducci, Roseanne Rosanna Dana. So stealing from um, other uh, performers is something that uh, I have a license to do. Uh, so, it's a poetic license to steal. So do you actually 
steal or do you just find inspiration from them? Both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But there are motifs that I that I use um, that are recognizable and I'm not embarrassed about. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, it, uh, stealing material, I would never, I don't steal material. Right, 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 I right. steal motifs and accents and gestures and uh, yeah, right. I don't steal material yeah. without permission. <laughs> Anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anymore. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was that, that was part of the crux of the personal storytelling thing, right? Because mm. everyone was telling folk and fairy tales. Mm -hmm. The internet wasn't around, so finding alternative st stories was a lot more hard work. Uh huh. And people realized that you couldn't steal a personal story. Right. And that's is that how it happens? Because I wasn't here and I wasn't around then. But this is the gist that I'm getting. Yeah, I can point to a moment, um, a storytelling conference at Connecticut College in whew, a long time ago, in which J. O. Callahan presented um, a wonderful story. I think it was called The Dance, which was a personal story about um, his family. And at that same Connecticut College event, the head of the National Association basically invited the community to avoid copyright problems by telling personal stories. And that was the moment that the sea changed. The sea change began. The wow. tide uh, changed. And the result is the personal season. stories. Yeah. yeah, it was an amazing... And I think it was... The Connecticut College. I don't know what year it was. So, were there a lot of other professional storytellers there then at that particular conference? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was an early conference, and um, maybe in the '90s, somewhere in the '90s, and it was a really, it was a big, it was a big, big thing deal. at yeah. Connecticut College. I forget year. I forget the the actual number of the year, but I remember the moment when the the um, the main speaker said. Um, the way to go is personal stories. And it did solve the problem of theft, and it solved the problem of copyright. Right. But it didn't solve the problem of people kvetching about their aches and pains, which to me is the too often the basis for the personal storytelling movement. There are some people that are really good at it. Uh -huh. there, are, there are some people that are remarkable at it because they find the universe the universal yeah. of, of what yeah. it is and yeah. that speaks to all of us. Right. And even though they're talking about something personal that happened to them, the way they approach it allows us to see ourselves in that moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with that issue. Mm -hmm. And then when the res resolution comes around, mm -hmm. we can all apply that yeah. in some way or another. Yeah. I think there are, there are several geniuses yes, of storytelling. I, I, Donald Davis is one of the right. geniuses of storytelling who started doing Jack Tales. He started off doing Jack Tales. Right. And then... Now he does not do Jack Tales primarily. I've never heard him do a Jack Tales. Mm. But the structures of the Jack Tales are implicit in his work. They and, are. And, but that makes it difficult um, for the rest of us because people say, oh, Donald Davis can do it. Well, I can do that. But that ends up with people... Um, kvetching about their aches and pains and I think that this is one of the causes of storytelling's um, decline in terms of audience because an audience comes and hears someone complaining about their life on stage they will not come back to another storytelling event and I think if there is a decline in storytelling audience numbers it has to do with personal storytelling burdening the audience can, can I counter that yeah do you do you think that people are possibly drawn to other events such as the moth and the glitz and glamour of that which is the personal narrative because there's something immediate about it and mm -hmm. there's something real about it mm -hmm. and that the audiences that you and I have been working with you more so than I because you've been doing this way longer than I have um, audiences at Jonesboro um, 
not to put too fine a point on it, are dying mm-hmm. off. That they're aging out, as it were. Uh-huh. And the young people don't know about it, so they're, they're, they've been attracted to the moth and, and uh-huh. those types of events. Yeah. And yeah. so we don't have th- these young people coming up through places like Jonesville. Do you mm-hmm. think that's possible? Well, you, you may be right. Um, you may be right. Um, I don't. I don't know. The moth certainly is a phenomenon, and one of the things that was sweet about this past Jonesboro was the appearance of moth veterans and moth successes mm-hmm. at the festival, um, in the exchange place in yes. particular. Yeah. Yeah. So, the moth is a phenomenon. It is a phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a trick question. Oh, good. <clears throat> Thanks for waiting with it. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. What is your favorite breakfast? Where would your favorite place be to eat that favorite breakfast? And who would you eat that favorite breakfast with? Hmm. My favorite breakfast would be... Um, Ulster fry, or some, sometimes called a full English breakfast, or sometimes called a full Irish breakfast. And uh, my favorite place to eat that would be um, my favorite place to eat that would be down Abbey Street in Dublin with Jack Lynch and James Joyce. Wow. That's, that would be an interesting breakfast. <laughs> is, that, is that what you meant? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yikes. I mean, it can mean whatever you want it to mean. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could say Megan Hicks and, and, and Jack. And, oh, no, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my favorite would be um, pancakes at Megan and Jack's house. <laughs> Does With Simon Brooks. That's <laughs> sure. what I meant to say. That's what sure. I meant to say. <laughs> sure it is. Does Meg make pancakes? Does Megan make pancakes? I have, no, make make pancakes? I have no idea, but they're very healthy. They yeah. are. They are very healthy people. Yeah. Ed, thanks very much indeed My for pleasure. taking this time out of your day. Thank you for coming um, over to Megan Hicks's place yeah, and yeah. doing this. I really appreciate it. Well, it's been great to see you again. Yeah, I've enjoyed your season. work. Thank you. And appreciate you, and I appreciate your mm, standing for the traditional tale and moving the t- traditional f- tale forward. I think you and Heather Forrest might be the last of the bunch. No, so, there's, there's, thank a few, you. there's a few others. Our conversation continued, and we began naming other storytellers who still tell folk and fairy tales, such as British, Welsh and Irish storytellers like Eric Madden, Maria Menzies, Taffy Thomas, Claire Murphy, Daniel Morden, Ben Hegarty, and the likes of Caroline Quiroga Stoltz, Antonio Hosher, Donna Washington, Rachel Ann Harding, Sheila Arnold, Joseph Bruchak, Carol Birch, Gwenda Ledbetter, blah, 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 blah. Some of these tellers and more can be heard on Rachel Ann Harding's Story Story podcast. Ed and I spent two hours together, so massive thanks to Ed for sitting down with me for this long. It was a pleasure. I hope you, my listener, enjoy this episode as much as I did recording it. To find more of Ed, his website, where there are videos of some of his performances and CDs and books of his, you can buy at edstivender.com. That's E-D-S-T-I-V-E-N-D-E-R.com. There is another interview with Ed at thestoryblender.com under past recordings. I hope you learned about the art and the ways to look at the craft of storytelling. I also hope that you like the new music composed by Chris Jed, a friend of mine out of Nashville, with a cracking band called Blackpool Mecca. To help keep this podcast going, please consider making a donation, large or small, if you can, through my Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash Simon Brooks. If you cannot do that, then help me out by doing something you can do. I would love it if you were to leave a review on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, wherever you found this episode. It helps not just me, but it helps others find this podcast. I am on Instagram, Simon M. Brooks, and Facebook, Simon Brooks Storyteller. Join the fun. Thanks again for being here with me and my guest each month. Until next time, be healthy and happy. Cheers. Cheers.